Hello. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm going to be giving a talk on the diagnosis and management uh, of hemoptysis. So this is a brief outline of our discussion today. So we'll define massive hemoptysis, review the pulmonary blood supply, discuss uh, causes of hemoptysis, and then the management strategies. So the term hemoptysis comes from, uh, is derived from the Greek terms hyma for blood and, and uh, tissus for spitting. It accounts for about 11% of admissions on pulmonary services, uh, and that's certainly higher uh, for interventional pulmonologists. And then 6.8% of outpatient pulmonary clinic visits. Uh, what is defined as massive hemoptysis? So there isn't really a universally accepted definition for the volume. The most common definitions described in the literature range anywhere from 100 to 500 milliliters over 24 hours. However, you, you'll see descriptions of up to a liter. Um, the table on the right, as you see, we usually describe for patients at least um, volume of hemoptysis in, in the context of teaspoon, tablespoon, or cups. Um, massive hemoptysis, anything basically from a half a cup to a cup uh, will uh, cover most of them. And massive hemoptysis itself accounts for about approximately 5 to 15% of all hemoptysis cases. You know, when we get these calls for hemoptysis, a lot of times uh, providers will, will tell us that the hemoglobin is stable, but uh, the reality is that it doesn't really make a difference. And the reason it doesn't is because the anatomical dead space of the average anatomical dead space for the major airways is only about 150 milliliters, and that's less than a unit of blood. So your, your conducting airways can be obstructed with a minimal amount of bleeding. And this is ultimately what leads to a lot of mortality that's related to massive hemoptysis, is acute airway obstruction and hypoxemic respiratory failure due to that, and, and less due to exsanguination and hemodynamic instability that is a result of that. So the more relevant definition would be more along the lines of the amount of the volume of blood that is life-threatening by virtue of air obstruction. And clinically, that can be translated to impaired gas exchange, patients who need intubation, when you have spillage into the contralateral lung, and then hemodynamic instability. And again, that's not, that, that's not necessarily due to volume loss, but probably due more to um, result of hypoxemia. So what's the mortality associated with massive hemoptysis? A lot of it depends on rate and volume. So in terms of rate, this was a, a retrospective study done in France a long time ago in the 60s. And they took patients who all came in with massive hemoptysis and their study, they defined it as greater than 600 milliliters uh, over 48 hours. And they, they actually spun down these patients' sputum and measured the volume of hemoptysis and found that in patients that uh, had that same volume of over 600 milliliters over 16 to 48 hours, the mortality was only 5%, whereas 4 to 16 hours is 22%, and then less than 4 hours is 71%. So that's a pretty drastic jump. So when you're assessing patients with massive hemoptysis, rate is a, a pretty important clinical indicator of how they're going to do. It's important to ask when the last episode they had was, and how about the episode before that, or the, is the time interval between episodes getting worse, shorter, or about the same? The other component is volume. Uh, this is a, was another retrospective study in the 80s where they looked at uh, volume over 24 hours and compared mortality. So over a liter in this study, you had a mortality of 58% versus 9% of less. And then when they com combined a, a etiology of malignancy to the over a liter of, of hemoptysis over 24 hours, the mortality jumped to 80%. So what are other predictors of mortality when it comes to hemoptysis? This was a um, retrospective study in 2012, over 1,000 patients, all comers for hemoptysis, mild, moderate, or severe, uh, with hemoptysis being the primary uh, or the principal reason for admission. And in this study, they saw an overall hosp in-hospital mortality rate of 6%. Risk, independent risk factors that they determined here included chronic alcoholism, etiology of cancer, aspergillosis, a chest x-ray showing at least two radiologic quadrants involved, um, mechanical ventilation, and pulmonary arterial source. So what are the different lung, uh, lung blood supplies that, that um, are important to know in patients who have hemoptysis specifically? So your, your, your lung blood supply is uh, 
contributed by one, your pulmonary circulation and two, your bronchial circulation. So we'll talk first about your pulmonary circulation. As you can see here, your pulmonary circulation source is coming from your RV. It's a low pressure system because it's coming from your right heart and it terminates in your uh, alveoli where gas exchange occurs. The other lung uh, blood supply for your lung is from your bronchial, so your bronchial artery circulation. Most often it comes off of a branch from your descending aorta, but it can come directly from the aorta or it can come from intercostals or vertebral arteries. These end in peribronchial plexi uh, that, that supply the mucosa and the submucosa of your airways. And this, uh, as um, opposed to your pulmonary circulation, this is a high pressure system can this, because it's a systemic blood flow coming from the left side of your heart. So when it comes to massive hemoptysis, 90% of the cases originally from your bronchial circulation, um, with only 5% coming from your pulmonary circulation and another 5% coming from neither. Your bronchial circulation, because it is systemic, it's going to be a more rapid and life-threatening bleed, whereas your pulmonary circulation uh, has a lower pressure, lower resistance, and a higher capacitance to tolerate larger volumes of blood, so um, a less, less life-threatening bleed. So we'll transition now into talking about different causes of hemoptysis. And to illustrate this, we have a couple cases. So here we have a 58-year-old gentleman, history of pulmonary sarcoid on chronic immunosuppression, including prednisone. Also has a history of aspergillosis that was treated in the past, pulmonary hypertension, as well as diastolic dysfunction. He came in with massive hemoptysis over 24 hours, uh, measuring about a cup. This was at his admission chest x-ray. So you can see he's got bilateral uh, interstitial infiltrates. Um, you can see some what looks like tram tracking from bronchiectasis. He's got chronic fibrotic changes, particularly in his upper lobes. He got a CT, and here you can see as you uh, move uh, cauded that he's got upper lobe predominant cystic bronchiectasis. Um, seen on both sides and then here you can see a soft tissue density that that likely represents his, his history of aspergillus disease. Um, so when you have a CT like this and a patient with massive hemoptysis it's it's challenging to know exactly where it's coming from because he has so many potential sources with his bronchiectasis. So you know when a bronchoscopy this is a image of his distal left main stem bronchus this is his uh, LC1 and then when we looked into his left upper lobe this is the upper division of his left upper lobe. That's where we saw bleeding coming from. The likely source was his aspergilloma. So uh, causes of hemoptysis, back in the 1960s, TB, bronchiectasis, and lung abscess made up more than 90% of the cases. Uh, now that has certainly changed, although these are still um, significant contributors to hemoptysis, but in the setting of antibiotics and, and now lung cancer, uh, this. This has changed, however, we'll, we'll talk first about bronchiectasis and infectious etiologies. So bronchiectasis, how does it contribute to hemoptysis? Well, this is chronic airway inflammation that ultimately leads to hypertrophy and tortuosity of the, the bronchial arteries nearby these airways. You get expansion of the submucosa and the peribronchial plexus. And when these rupture, either the, the arteries themselves or the, the um, uh, the blood vessels in the submucosa, that's when they bleed. And again, these are subject to uh, systemic pressures, so um, more rapid bleeds due to the high pressure system. Uh, when it comes to infections, we'll talk about, we'll touch on TB, fungal, and lung abscess. When it comes to TB, it usually gets subcategorized into active TB versus chronic TB. With active TB, um, etiologies to bleed bleeding basically, you can have um, ulceration from necrosis into the adjacent blood vessels. And then uh, you can also have Rasmussen aneurysm. So these are, are rare, um, but they are basically pseudoaneurysmal dilations of a branch of the pulmonary artery that often sits near a cavity, as you can see here on the CT angiogram in here. Uh, these are rare causes of bleeding in active TB, but they can be fatal. Um, when it comes to chronic TB, um, you know, you have, you have bronchiolis that are essentially healed calcified lymph nodes that can erosion, erode into nearby vessels. 
can get bronchiectasis again. And then if you have a cavity from prior TB, you can develop a fungal infection within it. When it comes to fungal infections, the most commonly thing we think about with hemoptysis is usually aspergillomas. Um, these uh, are more likely in patients who have pre-existing cavitary lung disease. And then another time to think about them is when you have an in immunocompromised patient, specifically in the BNT population. And this is usually after engraftment or after treatment when, when the neutrophils start returning, you get increased local inflammation and um, and hemoptysis in patients with aspergillomas can be seen in more than half of the patients, so it's not uncommon by any means. And then lastly, lung abscesses, abscesses that, can, that can contribute to hemoptysis. Other infectious etiologies um, that I didn't mention much would be necrotizing pneumonia, septic emboli. And then of course, cancer. So um, Non-massive hemoptysis occurs in up to 10% of lung cancer, presentation, uh, lung cancer patients at the time of presentation, and about one in five of all lung cancer patients will have hemoptysis at some point, uh, although a majority of them will not be massive. That's only, that only accounts for about 3% of them. Risk factors in patients who have lung cancer that are more likely to have hemoptysis includes centrally located tumors, uh, tumors that cavitate, and then squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, which which are uh, usually cavitating and more centrally located compared to adenocarcinoma. Of course, metastatic cancers to the lung can also cause hemoptysis with renal cell carcinoma being one that particularly bleeds more often than others. And then here we have uh, essentially a laundry list of other causes of, of massive hemoptysis that I'm sure many of you are already aware of. Um, so aside from infection and cancers we talked about, there's of course autoimmune disorders, di uh, diffuse alveolar, hemorrhage, uh, a lot of cardiac etiologies, uh, decompensated heart failure, pulmonary edema, and then of course iatrogenic causes from bronchoscopy, uh, especially in the setting of lung biopsies, and then trauma to the chest. Uh, other notable uh, causes um, that I do want to bring up, so it's important to rule out non-pulmonary sources, so taking a good history, making sure that it's not actually just a nosebleed uh, or um, a GI bleed. There's a number of times that hematemesis can be confused for hemoptysis. And then it's also important to note that one in five or 20% of cases will have no overt cause. And then I do wanna bring up tracheonominate artery fistula. So these are rare, uh, but when they happen, they carry a very high mortality. So less than 1% incidence. Um, and the time at which you'll see it is usually two weeks after a tracheostomy placement with uh, a big risk factor being low, a lower tracheal insertion site. Basically what it is, is you, um, when you have your tracheostomy balloon, it can cause, especially in the setting of a low tracheostomy insertion site, the balloon can irritate the mucosa and erode through the wall and basically uh, create a fistulous tract with the innominate artery. When they bleed, they bleed fast and a lot. And the ways that you can potentially manage them in an acute setting would include overinflating the cuff for the tracheostomy, taking the tracheostomy and putting in a, a smaller ET tube with your cuff of the ET tube distal to the trachea, uh, uh, distal to the anomena artery, ideally. And then if it's a real emergency, this is called a little Dutch boy maneuver where you essentially uh, are trying to put pressure on the innominate artery. So you place your finger through the stoma and you pull up in an anterior downward uh, direction to apply pressure to this artery to temporarily control the bleed. The issue with this manage, uh, with having using this maneuver is obviously you're obstructing the airway, so you're eventually going to run into oxygenation issues. Uh, this is a surgical emergency. If it happens, you you essentially have to uh, take them to surgery right away. Um, with all this in, uh, after having all, discussed all these potential etiologies, the most common cause at the end of the day is your run-of-the-mill bronchitis. Diagnostic workup for hemoptysis. So it's important to take a detailed HMP, and a lot of that is in order to tease through all the different uh, potential etiologies. When it comes to triaging these patients, uh, again, important things to keep in mind are uh, the rate at which they're having the volume at which they're describing to you are their symptoms getting better or worse. Uh, and then also taking into account things that are predictors for higher mortality in hemoptysis patients, for instance, etiologies being 
uh, lung cancer or um, aspergillosis. Uh, it's important to also obviously check for coagulopathies as you do with any bleeding condition. Um, are they on any home medications that would need reversal? Um, and then uh, chest imaging is usually already going to be obtained by the time they call you with a chest x-ray being helpful to grossly localize. Um, but uh, as you can see here from a diagnostic tools in, in terms of evaluating massive homoptosis, CT and bronchoscopy are going to be your better tools. With CT having uh, better, better at uh, revealing the underlying clause because you can you can obviously look at your parenchyma, and then it's still pretty good at ident identifying the site. However, bronchoscopy is a little bit better. When you do get a CT, contrast is helpful if, if the patient's kidney function can tolerate it because it allows you to to look for vascular abnormalities that could be the cause. Next, we're going to dive into talking more about the management of hemoptysis. Uh, so three main things to take uh, to, to remember. Basically, one, you want to establish an airway and ma maintain your ABCs. Two, you want to localize and contain the source of bleeding. And then after you do one and two, then definitive treatments for the hemoptysis. But before all this, one thing that you can do is, is um, place them in a lateral decubitus position. So this is really only helpful if you know which side they're bleeding from or if you're highly suspicious based off your either preliminary imaging, your physical exam, or knowing their history. Um, but if someone's having massive hemoptysis before you even can secure an airway, if there's any, something you can do immediately is putting them bleeding side down. So for instance, in a patient like this, you have this x-ray or you know this history, it's most likely coming from the left side. You just put them left side down to protect your right lung. So the first step uh, after that would be to establish and secure your airway. Yeah. Reasons to potentially indicate uh, to intubate a patient. So if they can't clear their secretions, if they're having rapid ongoing hemoptysis, if they are in worsening respiratory distress, they're having gas exchange concerns with progressive hypoxia, or if there's any degree of hemodynamic instability. These patients should be intubated with a large bore ET tube, eight and a half at least. And the reason is uh, it allows for bronchoscopic interventions and allows for suctioning. When it comes to intubating patients with massive hemoptysis, you'll see in the literature they describe two, two different techniques you can use, but really only one of, one of them that's advised. So main stem intubation is, is the, the main take home. And again, you, you have to have a, a, a known laterality to the bleeding. And the, the goal of it is again, to protect the non-bleeding lung from spillage. This should be done with fiber optic uh, assistance. And uh, things to keep in mind if you're going to main stem intubation, intubate someone. So first off, e normal ET tube length is 30 centimeters. It does get smaller with smaller ET tube size, but I believe anything that's seven or bigger is usually 30 centimeters. If you have a patient who's really tall or a long trachea, there are instances where you may not be able to main stem. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is if you're trying to right main and in, uh, right main stem intubate, if they have a short right main stem, there's a chance that you might end up occluding the right upper low bronchus, which could be an issue in terms of oxygenating someone who may have bad lung function. And then the other thing to keep in mind is once you do main stem intubate someone and secure the ET tube um, to make sure everyone knows to minimize head movements. Uh, with, for instance, if you bring, if the patient's chin were to move down, the ET tube would move proximally, and if their chin went up, uh, it could move distally and dislodge placement of your tube. The other uh, technique that you'll read about in the literature is uh, using a double lumen ET tube. However, double lumen ET tubes in the setting of massive hemoptysis are uh, strongly not advised. Uh, the reason of this is they are difficult to place. They're large tubes. They're very time consuming to place. They will also require fiber optic guidance, but more importantly, uh, each of the individual lumens is very small because you have two lumens in, in the tube. And even for your largest double lumen ET tube, your uh, lumen and luminal diameter is less than seven millimeters. So these are more likely to obstruct with blood. And more importantly, you're less likely, you cannot get a therapeutic bronchoscope in there to uh, manage their hemoptysis. So, don't put a double lemon ET tube in these patients. After you secure the airway, the next step would be to localize and contain. 
Uh, so here we have a 48 year old gentleman, active smoker. He comes in with massive hemoptysis with this CT of his chest. Uh, you can see here his parenchyma looks actually looks okay. His airways look okay. There's nothing grossly abnormal here. Uh, so we ended up getting a bronchoscopy and we were able to isolate um, a blood clot in the right upper lobe apical subsegment. He then underwent a bronchial embolization and they found some hypertrophied vessels in his right upper lobe apical segment. So he got embolized up there and uh, hemoptysis resolved. So the role for bronchoscopy in patients like this where, where this, the chest imaging is, is not, um, doesn't really give you a source is, is crucial to help localize the source. And then uh, containing the bleed. So the, the biggest goal in containing bleed is essentially to prevent spillage into the uninvolved lung. And again, we've already talked about ways you can do this, lateral decubitus positioning, main stem intubation, um, mechanical maneuvers, including balloon tamponade, which I'll talk about shortly here, and then cough suppressant. So you can put these patients on scheduled codeine or nebulized lidocaine to um, minimize their cough, minimize the chance of them uh, dislodging a clot that they've created. So when it comes to mechanical maneuvers for containing a bleed, uh, balloon tamponade is something that um, we use. So the goal of balloon tamponade is to allow for clot formation and achieve hemostasis. And the goal here is really just to stabilize the airway for definitive therapies. And we'll talk about the definitive therapies, but you're, you're, again, your main goal here is really just to stabilize them. When you use a balloon in the airway, you want to inflate until you have some blanching of the mucosa. And then it's also important to note that the balloon must be deflated every 24 hours. And the reason for this is to prevent ischemia of the mucosa caused by the pressure of the balloon itself. It also prevents uh, post-obstructive pneumonia from developing and then more importantly allows you to reassess the bleed. There's two main types of balloon blockers that you'll see. Um, there's, there's a lot of different brands and a lot of different types. The two that we use here, so there's an arm endobronchial blocker made by Cook and then uh, there are Fogarty balloons. The Fogarty is the, the company, the ones we use here actually aren't Fogarty, but these are basically vascular balloons um, that you can use to um, control a bleed. So the first one we'll talk about is the Arn Cook balloon blocker. So this one is, the main benefit of this one is that it can stay in place uh, without the bronchoscope in there. So it comes with a ET tube adapter here, and what you essentially do is after you put this ET tube adapter on, the balloon here gets uh, lassoed onto the tip of your uh, bronchoscope and then you drive your bronchoscope down to wherever you want to place a balloon and then you place it and you inflate. Usually you go through the ET tube. Here they picture the, the balloon outside the ET tube, which is a maneuver you can do, uh, but you'd have to drive it through the vocal cords and um, majority of the time we just go through the ET tube. Again, the benefit here is that once you inflate the balloon, you can pull out your bronchoscope and this balloon can stay in place. Um, again, similar to when you use a main stem intubation, you want to minimize head movements. This, the balloon is, is connected through the ET tube through the adapter, so you really don't want to dislodge it. The Fogarty balloon, on the other hand, uh, goes through your working channel of your bronchoscope. So here your bronchoscope, can you can drive down to wherever the bleeding is coming from. It goes directly through your working channel and then you inflate the balloon and you uh, hold pressure. Uh, the biggest downside to these balloons are easier to use, but however, again, the biggest downside is you can't remove your bronchoscope. And then lastly, uh, imagine anyone who's rotated through the bronchoscopy suite knows that you can wedge. Um, so again, these, this, this more often occurs uh, after a peripheral lung biopsy, like a TBBX or TBNA, where you know exactly where the bleeding's coming from. Um, the goal here is you, you basically just wedge your scope. Um, and you, some, some folks hold suction, some don't. The idea with holding suction is that you're creating collapse and atelectasis for further tamponade and, and clot formation. You should be holding wedge for four minutes, and this is based off the upper limit of normal for clotting time. And then uh, after four minutes, you break wedge, see if you're still bleeding. If you are still bleeding, you wedge again. And usually at that point, you would wedge for eight minutes and reassess. Topical therapies for controlling bleeding. So the, the two most common would be uh, isaline and topical epinephrine. Uh, these are 
more commonly used in the setting of endobronchial disease, especially with topical epinephrine. You can use cold saline for peripheral lesions that are bleeding, but you have to use a lot of volume. So the average volume that you would have to use is up to 300 milliliters in order to tamponade peripherally and cause vasoconstriction. The a side effect that with cold saline is bradycardia. And then with topical epinephrine, it's a diluted formulation. So you, one to 100,000 is a lower concentration, whereas one to 10,000 is considered the higher concentration. These are used in aliquots of two to four mLs at a time. And after you, uh, usually nine out of 10 times with ep topical epinephrine, you can get control of a bleed, usually from an endobronchial source, assuming that you're not continuing to biopsy it. Other things that have been described include vasopressin, fibrinogen and thrombin or thrombin alone, but these are not uh, nearly as commonly used. And then more recently, there's been uh, data on inhaled TXA. Uh, so this was published in CHEST two years ago. Uh, this was a double-blind randomized controlled trial looking at nebulized transoxemic acid. The protocol include 500 milligrams three times a day versus placebo with normal saline. They had about 50 patients that were randomized. 25 went to the transoxemic acid group. More than half of the patients were on therapeutic anticoagulation at the time of presentation. And these were for mild to moderate hemoptysis. So the mean volume of bleeding at admission was um, 51 and 35 milliliters respectively. And they excluded patients who had massive hemoptysis. Patients were treated for up to five days, but it was up to the treating physician in terms of when to stop. The primary outcome was uh, the rate at which patients had complete resolution of hemoptysis during the first five days. And then they also uh, looked at the difference in daily volume of expectorated blood between the two groups. Secondary outcomes included rate of needing interventional bronchoscopy, bronchial embolization surgery, and hospital length of stay. So what they found was, uh, as you can see on the top here, that the, the patients who were in the transoxemic, nebulized transoxemic acid group had complete resolution of hemoptysis in 96% of the cases versus only 50%, um, as you can see here. And then in terms of the expectorated blood volume, the, the um, transoxemic acid group had less volume compared to placebo. And then when they looked at their secondary outcomes, um, none, of the, none of the patients in the transoxemic acid group required additional procedures. And then the, the uh, patients in the placebo group were in the hospital for longer. There were no reported side effects in the transoxemic acid group. Um, in terms of cost, I'm, I, they did not look at the analysis for cost. This is, from my understanding, um, there are protocols being written here on when and how to utilize nebulized transoxemic acid for mild to moderate hemoptysis. And then lastly, we'll talk about definitive management for these patients. So after they, their airway secure, after you localize and contain the blood, uh, then you have to turn to how do you manage this? And again, this, a lot of this has to do with why do you think they're bleeding and where are they bleeding from? Um, so bronchial embolization, this is, um, the most common technique that's used. This is obviously done by the interventional radiologist. Over the years, they used a number of different embolizing agents, um, including coils, glue, gelatin sponge. Uh, currently, the polyvinyl alcohol particles is probably the most commonly used. Um, active extravasation is actually only seen in 10 to 15% of the patients. So, um, you know, utilizing CT and sometimes even bronchoscopy to localize the bleeding sources is really crucial to good outcomes for these patients. And uh, the immediate success range is pretty good, 60-90%. The folks who have the highest uh, recurrence rate include uh, etiologies such as TB, bronchiectasis, aspergilloma, and cancer. Um, and it, you can repeat embolization if patients continue to bleed. About 14% of the time, uh, they're not able to canalize the artery or the bleeding is coming from a non-bronchial artery collateral that they're not able to access. And then complications include vessel perforation, uh, tears, renal failure due to contrast. And um, the one that IR probably brings up the most, uh, and probably the most severe is paralysis. So about 5% of the time, an anterior spinal artery will come off a bronchial artery. And obviously, if you embolize that, then uh, you lead to paralysis in these patients. So 
another definitive management includes surgery. So uh, you should consider surgery in patients if they have a unilateral etiology uh, that's easily localized. Um, if they failed minimally invasive uh, treatment options, and then um, in situations where you know less invasive procedures are not an option, for instance, if you have a leaking aortic aneurysm as part of the bleed or pulmonary artery rupture, these are things that, that bronchial artery embolization or, bron or bronchoscopy are not gonna fix. The mortality for patients in surgery is two to 18%, and it's significantly higher if the surgery is emergent or extensive. Um, and uh, hemoptysis recurrence is low, as you can imagine. And then bronchoscopic options. So thermoablative um, tools can be used to control bleeding. Again, this is mostly in the setting of endobronchial disease. So we can use laser uh, argon plasma coagulation or electrocardery to help control bleeding. Cryotherapy can also be used to bleed as well as help extract a clot that is causing obstruction in the airways. So just an example of thermoablative technique. So this was a, a 56 year old gentleman who had squamous cell carcinoma of his left upper lobe, as you can see here on CT. Uh, this is his distal left main stem view, and this is the entrance to his left upper lobe. And we used APC to, to uh, basically control bleeding in this, scent, in this patient. Other bronchoscopic options that, that have been described, but certainly not commonly used. So glue, um, fibrin glue, or cyanocrylic glue, which is essentially super glue, using silicone spigots to plug. Uh, and again, these are very; these are kind of just case reports that have been reported in the in the IP world. And then you, of course, can use airway stenting. And the goal of airway stenting is to uh, tamp a nod and to maintain a patent airway in the setting of massive hemoptysis. So we all know about radiation therapy in patients who have lung cancer with large tumor burden hemoptysis, but they've also described um, radiation for um, non-malignant control of uh, hemoptysis. This was a, a case report using modified radiation dosing, so just once a week with lower radiation to help control bleeding from a mycetoma that worked. And then uh, lastly here, this is just a, uh, this is a treatment algorithm for massive hemoptysis. There's a lot of different treatment algorithms out there. This was one that I thought was, um, that I got a lot of uh, these slides from. But basically here, you, you know, you have a patient who comes with massive hemoptysis. The first is determining whether they have acute respiratory failure or not. Um, and that, uh, and the difference in management here includes um, how urgently you have to localize tamponade and potentially um, turn to definitive management. Uh, the next the next break in the tree here is if you're able to localize a bleeding or not. If you are able to localize a bleeding and it's coming from an endoluminal lesion, then here uh, you can use bronchoscopic tools to help control. If you're unsuccessful at that point from a bronchoscopic tool standpoint, then you go to bronchial artery embolization. If they don't have endoluminal disease, Again, you end up more times than not going to bronchial artery embolization. If that's unsuccessful, you can go to surgery, or again, you can also repeat bronchial artery embolization. On the other side of the tree here, if you are not able to localize the bleed, um, you can get a CT, although a lot of times you'll have a CT before this. Um, if you are able to localize on CT scan, depending on what the etiology is, you can, again, go down the routes of surgery, bronchial artery embolization, or even bronchoscopy. If you're not able to localize a bleeding, you know, there's been plenty of times where patients end up getting bronchial, just getting an angiogram to see if there's a vascular abnormality that they can later treat. Um, but this is, again, just one of many different uh, treatment algorithms that, that are uh, out there that you can follow for the management of massive hemoptysis. So some take home points, uh, massive hemoptysis can have a high mortality, uh, and it's primarily due to acute airway obstruction. Early recognition and action is key. Um, the most common causes outside of, uh, outside of your run-of-the-mill bronchitis include bronchiectasis, TB, lung abscesses, and bronchogenic carcinoma. And in terms of the management, the important things to remember include stabilizing your airway, localizing, containing the bleed, and then proceeding with definitive treatment depending on your etiology. 
Uh, so these are my references. And that's all. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. I just uh, wanna, uh, there were a couple of questions that were answered actually online while you were talking. But I just want to make some clarifications. Can you go back to your algorithm, Kevin, please? Yeah. So in, in terms of uh, the management of massive hemoptysis, uh, this is a good al algorithm uh, that Kevin presented here. One of the things that I would add on is that bronchoscopy or the role of bronchoscopy in hemoptysis, as already Kevin mentioned, is one for localization of the bleeding uh, and, and two, to try to see if there is any um, uh, uh, therapeutic intervention to stop the bleeding um, that could be done bronchoscopically. But in terms of localization of the bleeding, you have to consider something in terms of images uh, like a chest x-ray, but mainly a CT scan. They actually provide as much information sometimes as a bronchoscopy when it comes to localization of bleeding. So getting a hold of a previous CT scan uh, or a CT scan done during the admission or something even before can kind of guide you in terms of where to apply your therapeutic intervention, whether it's going to be um, 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 arterial embolization or surgery, et cetera. So keep that in mind um, uh, that when a patient arrives to the ICU with hemoptysis, the first thing that really, uh, well, be, after you you secure the airway, then and, and try to kind of hold the bleeding as much as possible, then an, a, a, an imaging is probably what, what's needed the most. So it kind of uh, gives you an idea where the bleeding comes from. Uh, another thing that I wanted to point out is the uh, use of uh, epinephrine as a potential um, uh, um, for potential management of bleeding, hemoptysis. Um, epinephrine is mainly used for endobronchial bleeding, uh, an area that can, you, you can actually um, apply to. It's a topical epinephrine. What you, do, what you use is a one ten thousand uh, solution. Now, historically, uh, the, the, the way epinephrine was used by Zavala in the 70s when, uh, on the 60s, when they started to perform transbronchial biopsies, uh, was um, transbronchial lung biopsies, was actually for bleedings that came from the periphery. And uh, he started to use a solution of one in 20,000 of epinephrine and apply an average of five to 10 milliliters. Uh, they, he noticed a, a decreased number of bleeding at that moment, of course did not uh, um, uh, talk about a massive bleeding in general, but bleeding, uh, bleeding overall uh, was decreased by the use of uh, topical epinephrine. So ag again, it's not the ideal approach. Uh, you can still use it if that's all you have. Uh, the ideal approach for a bleeding uh, is, should be tamponading first. And then if you have, if you get a hold of gold sailing, as, as Kevin already explained, for peripheral bleeding, that would be the ideal approach, if possible. Is there any other questions that that you guys have? You can actually type it. I'm gonna wait for a minute. Well, it seems that there is no other question at this point. Um, Kevin, any anything that you would like to add on? Uh, no, no. 
Oh, hold on, hold on. There is a there is a question here. Sorry. There is a, a if we can if you want to tell something or say something about timing of clot extraction in massive hemoptysis. Do you have any any input about that, Kevin? Or you want me to? Oh, uh, when to do it? Yes. Uh, I mean, usually, we, but it, it's in the setting of when you when you have impaired gas exchange. So, um, you know, high, high vent requirements, high FiO2, high PEEP, or you, if you have an x-ray that shows low bar collapse, um, those would be indications that, you know, you have a large clot somewhere in the central airways that then need to be extracted. Otherwise, it, you know, it, you, in fact, you want the blood to clot because that's what will help control the bleeding the best. It's, it's only when the clot is causing gas exchange issues that, that it needs to be extracted. Yeah, so so I agree with that. Uh, in general, you you prefer the blood to clot, so the bleeding can stop um, and and help help a formation of clot in general. However, uh, as Kevin mentioned, the uh, uh, when the patient has uh, inability to ventilate or to oxygenate because of that, then you have to help a little bit. In general, again, the, this is when the, the importance of having a localized bleeding. So if you know the bleeding is coming, for example, from the right upper lobe, uh, and then you're doing a bronchoscopy, you already intubated the patient, you secure the airway, but the patient is very hypoxic, you get in there, uh, uh, and you know that the bleeding was coming from the right upper lobe, but you're gonna see blood clots everywhere on the left side, on the, on, on the right middle, right lower lobe, etc. So what you want to do is start uh, cleaning, the, if something like that, removing or extracting blood clots from the left side in this case. Uh, try to improve the oxygenation, and if you can go and continue further, maybe try to remove uh, uh, blood clots from the right middle and right lower lobe, uh, 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 skipping the right upper lobe, so you allow the, the, the clot to remain in the right upper lobe uh, and being careful not to dislodge it, or if, the, if by cleaning the left side is more than enough to oxygenate the patient, then you may want to consider leaving it like that, um, at least immediately after the massive bleeding. Um, and then, and then as, as, as the hours or days goes, usually what we do is 24 hours, we perform another bronchoscopy just to see if that's being clean or not. And at the same time, try to work on the primary cause of the bleeding, right? Um, if this is a parenchymal bleeding, maybe a good idea before you remove the clot uh, to send the patient for um, arterial embolization, for example, and then after that, removing. Okay, so that would be it for this first presentation. Thank you very much, Kevin. It was a it was an outstanding presentation. Thank you for volunteering to do this in such such a short notice, and and also thank you to to Jen who's coming up with the next uh, um, lecture uh, for everybody. Uh, I just I just ask uh, for the fellows to stay online uh, after the presentation of Jen, so we can talk about a few things. Um, now that I have, right now I have uh, 31 people attending this this webinar. It's actually really good. I'm really happy that this actually is working out for everybody. So, the, and this is a great opportunity also for uh, to say um, how grateful we are for all of you, uh, of your dedication, your commitment, your efforts. Uh, you're doing really an outstanding job, helping everybody, helping your patients you know, with this pandemia, with this uh, um, tough times that we're all living in here. So thank you very much for that. So if you give, if you give us one minute, we're going to, uh, uh, let me make sure that everything is working. Uh, stay online, please do not, do not hang up, okay? Right. It should be shared. Yeah. And I can make sure everybody can hear me. Yeah, I think I can see everybody. 
Yeah, we can hear you. You guys can hear? Okay. Okay, so we're back now. Thank you for waiting. This next lecture is gonna be given by our fellow, our own Jennifer Hines. She's gonna to talk to us about approach to management of COVID-19 uh, in lieu of all these issues and pandemia that we're living right now. Uh, this is a great presentation when I review it really, uh, she did a very, a very nice job putting everything together. So we're gonna go with her now. And uh, remember, if you have any questions, please use the Q&I um, um, uh, option there on your screen. I'll be happy to answer them. If not, I'll just, I'll make sure that those questions get to Jen at the end of the presentation. Go ahead, Jen. All right, hi guys. Um, I am going to be kind of talking specifically about medication management and different therapies for um, COVID-19. So I don't know if it's as much as updates, it's just kind of what our basic medical management is. Um, you know, vent management is sort of a whole nother talk and we know these patients behave a little bit differently than typical ARDS. So I don't address that in my presentation, um, but I go through kind of the medications we're using and, and the reasons and evidence for why we're using them. So as we all know, uh, in December of 2019, there were a cohort of patients in Wuhan, China that came in with symptoms of a typical viral pneumonia. Uh, uh, from unclear agents. So after many of these cases were reported, um, they attempted to figure out what this viral agent was, thinking it was something new um, and behaved differently than viruses we already know about. So the way they kind of figured out um, the sequence of this is they took BAL fluid and sputum cultures from nine of the patients, uh, inpatients that were hospitalized and did genomic sequencing of them um, to see if they were similar to any prior viruses or this is something completely new. So when they did the genomic sequencing, they did find that uh, they were very similar to two bat-derived coronaviruses that we know about and have um, chemical databases of sequencing for, and then did have some overlap as well with SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, which are, are two coronaviruses we've had outbreaks from in the past. Um, so eight of the patients who uh, they took the samples from, had visited this Hunan seafood market in Wuhan, and so it was thought to be an intermediate host, um, thought that it originated in bats, and then there's uh, intermediate host, um, a kind of a common link for these eight patients uh, that visited this market and, and purchased things. So I don't know if anyone knows what this is, but it's called a pangolin. It's a, a scaly anteater, and this is what's thought to be the intermediate host um, facilitating it getting into humans. Um, the particular virus um, is this coronavirus, you know, that we all know, COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2, is of the genus beta coronavirus and the subgenus uh, Sarbate coronavirus. So this um, is a little outdated since I took this chart from Monday, but we all know that the first reported case in the U.S. was end of January. That probably wasn't the actual first case, but it's the first one that we know about and that was um, tested and reported. As of, again, this is a few outdated because the CDC updates it every day, but as of March 30th, so I think, believe Monday, there were 140,000 cases, uh, 140,904 with about 2,400 deaths reported. Um, obviously, I, we all think that that's probably an underestimate because we can't um, test everyone with our, our testing right now, and there are probably quite a few people that have very mild symptoms or don't end up presenting. Um, and so I think this number ultimately is pretty underestimated, but you can see, um, okay, we have the first case here and how things have taken off um, exponentially. Okay, so um, we kind of know about uh, coronaviruses in general, but um, they come from the family coronaviridae and they're single stranded positive sense RNA viruses that are typically 26 to 32 kilobases in length. Most strains in humans um, that we've seen in the past and, and you know, sometimes find on like our respiratory viral panels in the ICU cause kind of mild disease. So um, this one is obviously very different in that it causes um, 
severe disease. And the, the ones that have caused severe disease in the past that we know about, again, are the, the two big outbreaks that we've had, SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. So I just thought, this is kind of a busy slide, but it was interesting to look at the sequencing. So up here, you have your gene regions, um, you have the complete genome that was sequenced from these different viruses. Um, we have our two bat viruses and then our uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2. And you can see down here, uh, and it kind of gives you the percentage up here of how much overlap there is between the nucleotide and amino acid sequences. But I think more striking down here is looking at the genes and then where the overlap is. So the purple and the blue are two different bat-derived um, coronaviruses that we've known about in the past. And you can see there is some overlap between gene 1AB, 1B, and then um, some here as well. Uh, but really they differ here in this um, region of these genomes. So the nine patients that were sampled um, had their BAL fluid and culture isolates uh, sequence. Of that, they were able to get eight complete sequences and two um, partial sequences. And those eight complete sequences, uh, genome sequences, I'm sorry, were nearly identical across the whole genome. So essentially almost 100% identical. Uh, so we knew there's kind of a new novel virus going around. This is ultimately based on this um, genomic sequence. They were able to develop a real-time PCR assay, which is what we now know that we use for testing. Um, in analyzing the structure of the um, COVID-19 a receptor binding domain, and, and we'll look at a picture here in a minute. Um, they also compared it to, again, SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV and tried to determine where the overlap was um, as far as where the virus binds and gets in and what the receptor domains look like. When they did this, they found that, um, this, the suspicion anyway, is that uh, COVID-19 also uses ACE2 as their cell receptor to get in. Um, so you can see here that this is the SARS-CoV and this is the MERS-CoV. Um, SARS-CoV we know gets in by binding to the ACE2 receptor and MERS-CoV uh, binds to the CD26 receptor. Um, and then this is kind of our, SARS or our COVID or SARS-CoV-2 with this quote unknown uh, receptor binding domain. You can see the core subdomains down here in the magenta purplish color and then how the um, receptor binding domains differ. So here you have orange for the SARS-CoV, uh, kind of a purple color for the COVID, and then uh, green for the MERS-CoV. And you can see between um, our prior SARS virus we know about and uh, our you know, novel COVID that there are some differences in um, the nucleotide sequencing and like your <clears throat> amino acids. So but it was still thought that there is overlap, and this is probably how they get in, is uh, the ACE2 receptor. So when we think about how um, COVID gets into the cell, there are a couple of different pathways. So it can come in endosomally and be taken in that way or bind um, to receptors on the cell surface. Once it gets in, it, it's, uh, pretty smart virus and it has multiple proteins to kind of replicate its RNA, uh, release um, nucleocapsid, uh, transcribe things, and then again, replicate itself over and over. And it has um, genomic sequences for these proteins uh, to be able to continue to replicate. So <clears throat> once these mRNAs are synthesized, then they're made into proteins and these proteins essentially protect the virus. They, are either accessory or structural in nature. Um, and then it's released uh, into the extracellular compartment by exocytosis. So I know this is all a little bit uh, going back to our um, basic sciences, but I think it's kind of important to know how it gets in uh, when you think about drug targets and where you can go to inhibit this. Okay, so this is a busy slide um, and I don't, want to go into a ton of detail on the um, genomic sequences, but I do want to point out the structure of the virus um, and the different genes that it encodes. So we're looking at our um, SARS-CoV. These orange spikes essentially are where um, they're structural proteins that are glycoproteins that allow it to 
um, bind to cells. The uh, E here stands for envelope protein, allows the virus to have an envelope, um, sort of as a protective mechanism and, and is also a way they endosomally get in. Um, M is the membrane protein we see right here, uh, which is structural in nature. And then N is your nucleocapsid protein. And all of these things together kind of form the virion. And then you can see up here that, you know, different helicases responsible for viral replication um, and the different sequences that go along with make, make essentially coding for these proteins. So when we think about drug discovery um, and how can we treat our patients, we have kind of three ways we can look at this. Uh, do we have any broad spectrum antiviral drugs that we already have that we know uh, would be inhibitory or um, useful for management of COVID-19? We can also look at um, chemical libraries that have large numbers of existing compounds and databases um, that have information on transcriptional signatures in different cell lines. That's how uh, we looked at lopinavir, ritonavir, and then obviously making new drugs that target specific um, spots in, in the viral enzyme. So for instance, block the receptor protein or block one of the helicases. Obviously faster to use things that are already existing uh, than to come up with new medications. So I don't know how well this shows up for you guys. It's a little bit blurry for me, but I just wanted to bring this picture in, um, ultimately just to show all the different sites that you could target with drugs. Um, it's kind of overwhelming how many. Again, you can try and um, inhibit endosomal um, entry into the cells, and that's where like hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine are thought to act. Um, you can try and again inhibit viral replication, um, protein uh, production by the virus. So just a lot of different places that we could look at trying to target to prevent this thing from replicating and making more proteins to be able to do so. So part of the problem um, with drug targets in COVID is that even though there's all these targets and different drug options, a lot of the drugs are limited by their side effects or toxicity. Um, <clears throat> making it more difficult to use for treatment. So additionally, coronaviruses are one of the most diverse and rapidly mutating groups of viruses. So when they do that, essentially you, you know, obviously as you mutate, you can confer resistance to drugs that we have or, or new drugs um, designed for specific targets. And then in many of those that are in preclinical stages that we test in animals, there's not even enough animal data to know how uh, kind of the optimal delivery method for humans and how we would make this work in humans. So I think um, to take a step back and look at uh, some of the therapies that have been used in the past for SARS and MERS is kind of, I think, part of the basis where we started to think about what we could use with um, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID. When you look, this was a uh, systematic review that looked at the different therapies. So when they looked at just ribavirin um, for SARS patients, this particular slide is for SARS, I'm sorry. Um, they didn't see any significant effects on clinical outcome. Then they tried combination therapy with steroids, uh, Kalutra and ribavirin, and it seemed that these patients had a lower 21 day um, de progression to ARDS and lower death rates than those who just received uh, ribavirin and a steroid alone. So then it was thought that there, you know, may be some benefit for using lopinavir ritonavir, which we'll get to. Um, also, combining interferon alpha with steroids did show some improvement in um, oxygen saturation in, in past studies and more rapid resolution um, clinically and radiographically than steroids alone. Um, but again, that was in an uncontrolled study. When steroids were looked at in the past, false doses for SARS, they actually had a higher mortality rate and more complications um, in those patients. So the, you know, complications that I'm sure you guys are not surprised by, like disseminated fungal infection, avascular necrosis, hyperglycemia, kind of the, the things we think of when we think about steroids. Um, so, you know, a couple studies saw an increased 30-day mortality rate. Um, in another study, a randomized placebo-controlled trial that looked at uh, plasma SARS-CoV RNA levels in kind of the 14 to 21 days of the illness, 
um, were higher in patients given hydrocortisone than those given normal saline. So they actually thought that it basically prolonged viremia and, and uh, essentially made things worse. And then there had also been a little bit of studies done looking at convalescent phase plasma, which is something we'll touch on too toward, towards the end of um, my presentation, but has been used for severe respiratory tract infections in the past, including SARS and influenza, um, and has shown a reduction in mortality. Um, but this is obviously limited by availability of getting this plasma, and then when you give the plasma in terms of the time course of the patient's illness. Um, and then in another study uh, that looked at convalescent plasma, they had 80 non-randomized SARS patients who were given uh, convalescent plasma, and their discharge rate at 22 days in um, was higher. You can see 58.3% versus 15.6%. Uh, but again, I think what's mentioned here is when you give the convalescent plasma, you know, is it something we give early? Is it something we give kind of in the mid time course of the disease? And it's not something we're really sure of uh, yet at this point. So the prior slide looked at interventions in SARS. Uh, this one looks at um, a review that looked at prior therapeutic interventions for uh, Middle East respiratory syndrome. So <clears throat> the first one up here, if you look at it, um, is a combination of ribavirin and interferon alpha, and they didn't show any significant uh, effect on clinical outcome um, in the uh, treated versus control groups. Same thing with ribavirin and interferon beta. Now, if you combine um, ribavirin, interferon, and the uh, elytra again, that's where we saw some efficacy that the um, viremia resolved two days after starting treatment in a, in a patient with severe MERS. But again, this is limited by the fact that a uh, small number, um, and do we know which drug it really is, or is it the combination? Unclear. And then again, um, looking at steroids for MERS, uh, they did not show any favorable um, response in those patients. So now we're gonna kind of go to individual drugs and go through them. So remdesivir was actually initially under clinical development for treating Ebola. It's an adenosine analog incorporates into viral RNA chains, and that's how it um, causes premature termination. Um, so that you can't have viral replication. Um, there is some preliminary data from cellular research, and, and that's kind of what we're using this based off of, that it inhibits the uh, a viral, that COVID-19 essentially, um, and coronavirus in a human cell line. Um, so there is also some studies that looked at the combination, uh, just like we talked about our previous studies with SARS and MERS, of uh, remdesivir and interferon beta, as well as lopinavir and ritonavir interferon beta. So first looking at combinations, when they did some in vitro testing, um, looking at remdesivir and interferon beta, um, the two together seemed to have better antiviral activity compared with lopinavir ritonavir. And there was this thought that ritonavir doesn't, um, at least in in vitro data, doesn't significantly enhance the antiviral activity of lopinavir. Um, this was for MERS-CoV. And looking at remdesivir in mice, both prophylactically and therapeutically, it seemed to uh, reduce the viral load um, in them and the development of more severe lung pathology, thus improving um, pulmonary function. So if you look at prophylactic dosing of lopinavir, ritonavir, interferon beta, um, it slightly reduces viral, viral load, but otherwise doesn't really impact disease parameters, mortality, um, anything like that. Uh, therapeutically, um, there's been in vitro some improvement of pulmonary um, function, but again, does not reduce viral replication or, or severe pathology. So uh, in the first patient in the US um, who tested positive for COVID, uh, when he got worse and had kind of persistent fevers and worsening oxygen requirements and persistently positive PCR tests for viral loads for COVID, he was given um, compassionate use from Desivir. And uh, this is from an article in NEJM. Within two days, he was clinically markedly improved as far as, you know, afebrile, not feeling as short of breath and off oxygen. 
Um, but it's not without side effects. So you can see there it can cause phlebitis, constipation, nausea, um, can cause some elevated LFTs. Um, so something that we, I think initially we're using uh, on a compassionate basis, essentially, uncontrolled and compassionate use, that now at this point is being used in clinical trials. And I'm told by um, ID here that is something we're gonna be getting involved in. I don't know the exact timeline. Um, with these medications, uh, we know we need to kind of watch their liver function and chemistry profile just to look for adverse effects. So looking at steroids, um, I will present sort of the no and the yes argument. So if we look kind of at the past, again, that's what I'm, we're basing our um, evidence off of for COVID is um, MERS-CoV and SARS-CoV. Uh, and then this review looked at influenza and RSV as well. So <clears throat> when used in MERS-CoV, we kind of touched on these things, but they saw basically prolonged viremia and delayed clearance of viral RNA uh, from the respiratory tract. Same thing with SARS-CoV, except delayed clearance in the blood. Um, and then of course, steroids are not without complications, psychosis, IVs, avascular necrosis, and they, they did see those complications. So the thought was that there really wasn't a benefit to steroids. Um, and actually, in, and this is you know, the reason we look at influenza and we were initially testing for RSV and influenza that actually increases mortality in influenza. I think now that we're kind of getting out of flu season, um, probably do less testing for uh, influenza and, and just go straight to looking for COVID. Um, additionally, in patients who were given steroids in SARS-CoV, they did find that uh, they were more likely to require mechanical ventilation, vasopressors, and renal replacement therapy. And this was thought to be, again, um, likely from prolonged viremia and delayed clearance of the virus. So available observational data essentially suggests increased mortality in secondary um, uh, sorry, increased mortality in influenza and then potentially secondary infection rates as well. Okay, so a recent JAMA article came out. Uh, I guess I don't know how recent you consider this given that things with um, COVID are changing every day, but um, pretty recent article in JAMA that looked at risk factors associated with ARDS, um, progression to ARDS and death in patients um, with coronavirus in Wuhan. We know a lot of the data is either from the past or from um, the Chinese because that's where, you know, they have a little bit of lead time as far as um, getting data, looking at retrospective reviews, case series, things like that. So in a retrospective cohort study of 201 patients with confirmed COVID-19 admitted to a hospital in Wuhan between the end of December and the end of January, um, we can see here in table four um, that there were certain risk factors kind of related to um, developing ARDS or progressing to death, age being one, uh, greater than 65 being a significant risk factor. If we look at um, neutrophilia, that's also a significant risk factor. Uh, and then things like um, coagulation dysfunction, for example, we see our D-dimer over here. Uh, LDH up here, all statistically significant. So those seem to be predictors um, to tell you that, you know, these are the types of patients that seem to progress to ARDS and uh, potentially death. They also kind of collected epidemiological, demographic, clinical, and lab data for these patients. So what I found challenging about this paper is it didn't seem like there was a standardized dose or um, number of days of steroids, but they did look at um, overall survival probability and, and mortality in these patients, the patients that got steroids versus didn't. Um, this is among the patients with ARDS. So of those that received methylpred, um, 23 of 50, which is about 46%, the patients died and those who didn't, 21 of 34 or 61.8% of patients died, which did meet statistical significance. So then the thought is that potentially is steroids do uh, reduce you know, risk of progressing to ARDS and potentially death. 
Okay, looking at hydroxychloroquine. Um, a recent study looked at the activity of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine on uh, SARS-CoV-2 SARS infected um, varro cells, which are kidney epithelial cells um, from African monkeys. That's specifically what kind of cells they are. But anyway, it looked at the pharmacological activity and the pharmacokinetic models um, and essentially looked at the concentrations in uh, BAL fluid under five different dosing regimens um, to see kind of what would be the optimal dose of these medications to use while also being very careful to avoid toxicity because obviously they are associated with so QT, immunosuppression, um, and we want to make sure we use it effectively and safely. So it, hydroxychloroquine was found to be more potent than chloroquine. Um, and the optimal dose is, was recommended to be a loading dose of 400 twice a day, and then a maintenance dose of 200 twice a day for four days. Um, and again, it was much, much more, three times more potent than chloroquine phosphate when given twice daily. Um, we all know, I think, because we're doing this, that it should be given with zinc um, because it does enhance zinc uptake into cells, and then you have less um, free zinc. Okay, so azithromycin um, has shown, been shown to be active in vitro against the Zika virus and Ebola viruses um, and prevent kind of severe infections uh, when given to patients that are suffering these types of infections. So granted, this is a small um, single arm study, but in a French study, they looked at um, patients who received 600 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine daily um, and looked at their viral loads. And then they also looked at patients who received both hydroxychloroquine and, and um, azithromycin. And it was a small number. It was only like six patients who got both medications. But they gave these medications and then they looked at their viral loads daily. And the primary endpoint was uh, the presence or absence of the virus at day six of medication therapy. Um, uh, like I said, among these patients that were treated with combination therapy, there was only about six, and they got 500 milligrams on day one and then 250 milligrams for the next four days thereafter. So if you look at um, this chart here on the x-axis are the number of days, so out to day six um, being their endpoint, and then the percentage of patients here on the y-axis who still had PCR positive samples. The, the black uh, line up here is controls, the blue is hydroxychloroquine only, and the green is hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin together. So if you look here at a, there's kind of a big divergence um, at days three, four, five, and six of dual therapy. Um, we kind of start out here, the hydroxychloroquine group drops a little bit, um, the <clears throat> combination really doesn't change right away. But then when you, like I said, when you come to days three through six, you can see um, a significantly reduced percent of patients with PCR positive samples. And essentially all of the ones that got combination therapy um, by day six had cleared their viral loads. So um, at day six post-inclusion, 100% had, uh, were virologically cured as opposed to 57% in patients treated with just hydroxychloroquine alone. Um, and only 12.5% in the control group. So it's thought that there's some synergistic action between hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in terms of reducing viral load. This is, you know, we're going to talk a little more about this is limited by prolonged QT and side effects. So something we have to be very careful about. And um, I don't think we're often doing the combination therapy uh, if, you know, we're just sticking to the hydroxychloroquine alone. So as I mentioned, limitations to doing combination therapy um, are you know, QT prolongation. So typically if patients have a QTC greater than 450 for men or greater than 470 for women, um, with QTC greater than 500 being absolute contraindication for um, combination therapy with both plaquenilin and uh, azithromycin, obviously if they're on at baseline any other um, QT prolonging meds, if they have bad liver disease, which they can cause transaminitis, electrolyte problems. Um, and this is really why we haven't been able to do combination therapy very often. And if you are using combination therapy, um, after discussing it with infectious disease, really should be checking daily EKGs and LFTs, which I think most of us are. Um, additionally, there is uh, 
we know that COVID-19 has been associated with myocardial injury, myocarditis, um, kind of this end STEMI picture of injury to the heart and arrhythmias. So really monotherapy with hydroxychloroquine is preferred um, as the risk of QT prolongation is thought to weigh, outweigh the benefit of the two together. So looking at ribavirin uh, in experimental animal models, it, it, it actually enhanced the infectivity of SARS-CoV-1. Um, and then furthermore, in a systematic review of 30 different trials with ribavirin and SARS-CoV-1, we, we saw that 26 really were inconclusive for um, benefit and four actually showed possible harm. So this isn't something um, that we use or are, are considering. Okay. The recent uh, randomized controlled trial uh, published in NEJM that looked at hospitalized patients with COVID-19 and they assigned them in a one-to-one -one ratio to receive either lopinavir or ritonavir um, with the doses you see there, 400 and 100 respectively, twice a day for 14 days in addition to standard care or standard care alone. Um, and standard care, just to note, were comprised of um, supplemental oxygen, non-invasive or invasive mechanical ventilation, antibiotics, vasopressors, renal replacement therapy, um, and even DECMO. So kind of like all the other things, um, adjuncts that we're trying to use um, versus doing all of those things and giving the lopinavir, ritonavir. Um, <clears throat> they looked at uh, a seven category um, ordinal scale. It was their, their primary endpoint was time to clinical improvement on this seven category ordinal scale or discharge from the hospital. Um, so just to give you an idea of this scale, it looked at the following categories. So one would be not hospitalized, resume normal activities, and seven would be death. So anywhere in between, you know, able to not be hospitalized versus hospitalized not requiring oxygen, hospitalized requiring oxygen, requiring mechanical ventilation, et cetera, all the way up to death. Um, and they did not see, as you can see, as far as um, time to clinical improvement um, in the population, there really was no difference between lopinavir, ritonavir, and the control. Um, and so without any kind of significant difference in time to clinical improvement or mortality, um, this isn't something we're, we're uh, using at this point, but we're using early on. Okay, so we think um, that part of the clinical picture with COVID is uh, related to kind of this cytokine storm that leads to multi-organ failure. Um, and so it, it, it kind of looks like a secondary HLH picture um, with high uh, cytokine levels in IL-6 and multi-organ failure. So there <clears throat> was a paper done, a retrospective multi-center study again, from the Chinese, of 150 uh, confirmed COVID cases um, that seem to have this secondary HLH picture with elevated ferritins, um, and they looked at their IL-6 levels. Um, and, and this was kind of the basis and the thought for, okay, if they have this secondary HLH and cytokine storm, is there something we can do to combat this, uh, target this portion of what's leading to multi-organ failure? Um, so there's a scoring system you can actually use for secondary uh, HLH that looks at, you know, fever, um, whether they're febrile or not, whether they have any organomegaly, um, thinking of hepatosplenal megaly, do they have um, a, a leukopenia, do they have an anemia, a thrombocytopenia. So as it, I think it probably makes sense to everyone, as your numbers go up, it means more kind of end organ dysfunction and inflammatory state. Look at triglycerides, fibrinogen, ferritin levels. Um, and kind of the higher the levels, the more cytopenia, higher fevers. Um, these were all uh, much more predictive of a secondary HLH picture. Um, hemophagocytosis on a bone marrow aspirate was one of the criteria, but does not have to be present, obviously, to. Um, kind of tell you the probability for whether or not your patients have this. So um, this H score 11 generates a probability for the presence of this. Uh, and if the total number is greater than 169, it's 93% sensitive and 86% specific. Um, they also, I forgot to mention, included those that either have HIV or were on known immunosuppression. Um, and the immunosuppression 
included long-term therapy with steroids, cyclosporin, or azathioprine. Um, so this is kind of what led to thinking about tocilizumab. So uh, again, in two different Chinese hospitals, they had 21 diagnosed patients with severe or critical COVID, um, and they <clears throat> essentially gave them tocilizumab, and they saw that within a few days, the patient's fever curve really came down, their oxygen requirement came down, imaging improved, and all their inflammatory markers improved as well. Um, so if your patients, you know, um, meet the criteria that we'll talk about or really aren't getting better after hydroxychloroquine and steroids, it's definitely something to consider as a therapy. So this is the most, I believe, the most updated um, inclusion, exclusion criteria for what we're using here uh, at Henry Ford. You can see if you're suspicious for another type of infection, then you really want to look for that before giving this because it'll oppress the uh, suppress the immune system even, even further. However, if you don't think they're superimposed bacterial or fungal infection and they meet you know, criteria, which many of our patients do in the ICU of a fever for more than six hours, a PDAF ratio less than 150, and all these inflammatory markers that are severely elevated, then um, this can be beneficial for your patient. Uh, it previously was weight-based and now we're giving it as a standard dosing. Um, it's typically given 400 IV once now, and then uh, you can repeat the dose in 12 hours for a maximum of two doses if the patient continues to clinically um, decompensate and, and ID feels it would be beneficial as well. You can see some of the inclusion criteria, or if they have a really bad transaminitis, it can make that worse. Again, the immunosuppression here. Um, and then pregnant or lactating women, because we don't know this population. So other things, um, just in general management of these patients that are recommended are to be more conservative with fluids, um, kind of as you'd expect in ARDS as well. Uh, this anticoagulation one, I believe, has actually been updated. And so now um, there is thought that these patients um, have hypercoagulable state and microthrombi. I think this is where Dr. Hagab is trying to push through a clinical trial of using um, unfractionated heparin for treatment, but, but at this point, the data that we have, um, and I won't go into a ton of this, but uh, from what I've read, the papers I've read, the um, anticoagulation that they've done is prophylactic dose with Lovenox um, or heparin and, and not treatment dosing. Um, there was some thought to uh, avoiding ACEs or ARBs initially because of upregulation of the receptor and then you know, more viral load. Um, but this isn't proven, and if the patients have a compelling indication to be on it, they have chronic heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, um, heart disease, then you know typically we'll continue the meds. If they're not, uh, if there's no compelling reason to start it, you know typically you wouldn't. And then again, statins um, just kind of watch for side effects. Uh, Typically, statins aren't going to cause the same kind of CPK and LFT elevation that we're seeing in these patients, but um, just something to be watching for because if they're concurrently on a statin in addition to um, having COVID, obviously their LFTs and CPKs could be even more elevated. Um, I believe this one is still the most up-to-date lab monitoring. So you can see which labs we're doing daily and which labs we're doing every 48 hours. And there is now um, a, within the results review, a kind of a COVID tab that I'm sure everyone knows about where you can find all these labs and, and trend them out day to day. Okay, so I just wanted to touch on convalescent plasma because I think it's interesting and makes sense, but we don't have enough data for it. Um, there was a recently published article in JAMA that was a case series of five critically ill patients with confirmed COVID who all had ARDS and, and were pretty severe, um, who progressed rapidly, had high viral loads despite being treated um, with antivirals and, and mechanical ventilation. And so you can see um, here their PDF ratio as well. So <clears throat> these patients all received transfusion with convalescent plasma from prior um, people who had recovered from SARS-CoV-2 with pretty high binding titers, greater than one in 1,000. Um, and a neutralization titer greater than 40. And the outcomes they looked at were changes in body temperature, SOFA scores, their PEF ratio, viral loads, antibody titers, and then kind of um, 
you know, ventilatory support in ECMO and what they needed before and after their uh, plasma transfusions. So you can see, again, it's a very small sample size, but five patients, three were male, two were female. Uh, age range is anywhere from 30 to 70. Um, you can see the weight range. All of them had no smoking history. Um, mostly were blood type B, and the majority of them didn't have coexisting chronic diseases. And you can kind of see um, where they were at in their disease course. Um, this is symptom interval between symptom onset and admission, number of days, and then this is interval between admission and plasma transfusion. So most of them got it many days out. They'd already been treated with steroids and antivirals, and so. Um, clinically were not improving and in critical condition. And that's the time frame of when they were given their um, convalescent plasma. So is this something that would be beneficial early on? I'm not sure, but um, this is when they were, were given it, these patients. So looking at the results, um, you can see here, this is the graph for SOCLA scores, P to F ratio and body temperature. And so on the x-axis, you have days post um, transfusion and then and uh, then you can see SOFA scores here and, and you see um, the SOFA scores essentially going down for the most part um, in the different number of patients. These colors just correspond to which patient. Um, the P to F ratio for the most part got better in these patients um, and then the fever curve uh, primarily got better as well. So they saw that um, following plasma transfusion, body temperature normalized within three days in four of five patients. Their SOFA scores decreased, their P to F ratio increased within 12 days. Their viral loads also decreased and actually became negative within 12 days after transfusion. And then NutriBody titers increased as well. Um, in four of the patients, ARDS resolved uh, 12 days after transfusion. Three patients were able to come off of mechanical ventilation within two weeks of treatment. Um, three were able to actually be discharged from the hospital and two um, are in stable condition um, 37 days after the transfusion. Just kind of touching too on a vaccine. Um, there's a phase one clinical trial being done in Seattle, Washington that took uh, 45 healthy adults. They um, split them into three cohorts of um, 15. And these, patients, these volunteers were anywhere from 18 to 55 years old. Um, they enrolled them over a six-week period um, and then gave them each different doses, 25 micrograms, 100 micrograms, or 250 micrograms in, in two different doses of the vaccine. It's um, an intramuscular injection. It was developed using a genetic platform um, that basically directs your body's own cells to express the viral protein then and that with the thought be, being that that will elicit a uh, immune response and production of your own antibodies. Um, so it has shown some promise in animal models. Too bad we don't live in Seattle. I'd be signing up for this. Um, and that's where we're at with vaccination. So hopefully something coming um, down the road and they're monitoring for side effects as well. Um, just gonna touch on CDC and World Health, World Health Organization guidelines. Uh, there really is no U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved drugs that the CDC, um, you know, basically they have recommendations, but there's nothing that's FDA approved, essentially. Again, initially remdesivir was given on uh, uncontrolled compassionate use basis. Um, now it's really just being used in clinical trials. Uh, again, something that I think IDEA said we're going to be seeing here soon uh, once enrolled. Hydroxychloroquine also used on an uncontrolled basis. Um, and then I just put this link down here um, to kind of show, I won't pull it up, but how many clinical trials are underway related to this. And obviously lots of research is being directed towards finding um, medications or therapies uh, for COVID. Same thing, essentially the World Health Organization um, talks about the same medications and how they're used on an uncontrolled basis and there's really no FDA approved medications. This is the link that you can go to, but essentially it looks very similar to the CDC guidelines. Um, so this is the most updated regimen that I'm aware of that we have here at Henry Ford. Um, most of our patients obviously are gonna fall into the moderate to severe disease category. Many of the ones we're seeing are in the severe category where they've been intubated and are requiring mechanical ventilation. 
um, and have ARDS. So just kind of a review of the labs, excuse me, that we should be getting on admission and then daily or every other day. Uh, our standard treatment here, if they um, don't have any contraindications is hydroxychloroquine 400 twice a day and then 200 twice a day for four days. Um, we are now doing uh, steroids, 0.5 to one mg per kg per day. Um, div you know, initially, uh, I think we we're doing it divided in two doses, but many are doing it once a day now, given the pharmacokinetics for anywhere from three to seven days. It was initially only three days, but then what we were seeing is patients would come off of it and then days four or five would kind of turn back and have more of an inflammatory response. So we are um, kind of on a patient by patient basis, extending the course out to seven days. And then of course, IL-6 in specific cases um, after discussion with uh, the ICU and, and ID teams. I think we all probably know at this point, but things that make, should make you highly suspicious for COVID in terms of lab and clinical features are bilateral lung infiltrates, kind of, um, especially on CT, will look like patchy ground glass. Um, lymph, they're all, a lot of them are lymphopenic, have high ferritins, high CRPs, and high D-dimers. Um, I know Dr. Diaz is going to kind of go into moderating questions or comments, um, and then I have my references in here. Again, my disclaimer here is that things as far as management um, and therapies are changing every day, so hopefully I have a lot of the most up-to-date stuff for you, but I'm sure that there's been more that's come out that I haven't been able to address. Thank you very much, Jen. That was great. That was a great presentation. Um, a, a lot of things in general, as, as Jen said, continue to change over time and actually over a short period of times. Uh, I've had a, a few questions here from uh, the audience. Uh, one of them was, uh, for how long do you use the steroids uh, in general uh, for these kind of patients? It's just... Uh, Again, the, the 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 data that is out there is is really uh, very slim in terms of quality of the data. So most of these studies have been more like um, um, retrospective or case series. So and with a very low number of patients, as well as uh, um, uh, in general, not 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 following regulations. Some of them have not even been peer review yet. So, but anyways, overall, the um, the uh, um, uh, the recommendations that are given, I actually sent a link to all of you from uh, JAMA, uh, a recent article from less than a week ago, um, that can give you some guidelines in terms of management of uh, patients. But, but overall, uh, methylprednisolone, um, right now, in terms of guidelines, it should not be used in patients who are not on ARDS, at least this is, and this is a weak recommendation still. Uh, when it's used in patients who have developed ARDS, um, uh, but um, again, a weak recommendation because of the low quality data. And when they use it, they use it for up to five or seven days. Methylprednisolone IV, one to two milligrams per kilo per day in general. So that's pretty much what they supply. And as you know, as, as you see right now, the, the graphic that Jen already presented, uh, there is some data that could contribute to mortality or survival in general, but again, unfortunately, the, day, you know, the data there is not good quality, so we cannot really rely completely on this. Uh, do you want to add on something else there, Jen? No, I was just going to mention that even in this study that I that I have the graph up here from, it was kind of unclear the duration and dosing. So it's really hard to find guidance as to, like you said, what the dose should be and how long we should really be doing this to reduce mortality and um, kind of severity of their ARDS. Correct. So there's another question about um, uh, myocarditis in in, in these patients. Uh, number one is not it's not very common, uh, uh, but how would you follow it? The way it's being followed here, and I don't know if, if you have any other uh, suggestion, uh, Jen, but the way so far, what I've been, I've been talking to, to everybody here is just they've been following with, with troponins, uh, high sensitivity troponin T. It's pretty much what, what you try to follow with. Again, not that much that you can do. There is even a, 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 the, 
the question whether you should be using IVIG on these patients. Uh, again, not clear data about it, uh, but if it's going to be considered, as far as I, I know from all the conversations that we have every every day, is that is, you know, that there could be some role for that. Uh, but we'll have to be discussed again with ID. Right now, what what's happening on, on every ICU is, uh, you know, all this management and therapy. We we give the support, the ICU support, but when it comes to the management and even the use of steroids, you know, it's better to have like a multidisciplinary um, approach and discussion uh, overall, mainly that involves uh, infectious disease. That's what's happening pretty much at every single ICU here uh, in, in downtown. So, and, and the, the whole system, I would say. So there has to be some clarification still, but uh, again, you know, we have all this data, Unfortunately, no low qual uh, no no high quality data cannot be applied necessarily for every single patient that we have, and probably goes on case by case. We do need more data, that's for sure. Randomized controlled trials, but you know how long it takes uh, and how hard they are to to do. Actually, they are already working on on that, and and hopefully we have more uh, data that supports what we're doing right now. Yeah, I don't have much to add in terms of um, the myocarditis and arrhythmias and cardiac risks. All, all I'm really aware of is kind of trending troponins and mm -hmm. um, still kind of more thought of as, like you said, the inflammatory state. Yeah, so uh, there's some, uh, so there's some, some questions about, well, and again, it's uh, actually already saying that uh, probably following troponin FIC uh, calculations and uh, arrhythmias, low cardiac index, and, and they're considering IVIG for myocarditis, which is great. Uh, again, uh, everything has to be done, not in a, uh, has to be done actually on a, on a more multidisciplinary approach uh, for these patients in general. Um, um, Dr. Peralta is sharing there uh, an article about moderate to severe RDS uh, that was published in Lancet recently so uh, I also send a link uh, through the chat as I said for this uh, uh, sort of recommendations for management of critically ill patients in JAMA and, and how good the, 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 the data or how, uh, how, uh, how good the quality of data that we have and what the, what some based on those data um, some recommendations that can follow from it so I think there's also uh, a nice NEJM page that basically puts um, quite a few of the new uh, articles that are coming out on COVID-19 and management strategies. It seems like there's something new on there every day. So there's, uh, on, once you log into NEJM, there's a dedicated COVID page. Okay, yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, is there any anybody else who wants to um, uh, have any, or who has any questions or something that they want to share. So I think one of the, one of the things again, and just to, just to rephrase this, I know that we encounter data all over right now and, and, and the amount of data that's being produced, you know, over the last week or two is just, is just huge uh, about this. Um, again, it's, it's, it's hard to keep up uh, right now with all this information that's coming up as, as Jen mentioned. Um, it, it is important to follow uh, to, to some sort of protocol or protocolize the management in general, uh, rather than just doing things you know by our own uh, and that's why it's so important these discussions you know among the uh, people in, in ICU people in ID um, and, and everybody that actually taking care of these patients um, um, again always don't forget to to analyze the quality of the data that you read and, and where you read it and, and, and how that can impact the management of your patients in general. Again, you're gonna read a lot of things, not necessarily means that they work on every single patient that we have. Uh, this is time of, uh, again, we may 
feel a little bit desperate to try to find something at this point. I think all feel that way, try to do something for our patients, but at the same time, sometimes we can, we can actually do, do, do worse for them um, uh, in some cases. So again, uh, the, ideal, the idea thing is uh, we, we all approach in a systematic way, uh, review and discuss with, with a multidisciplinary approach and, at the, and also uh, try to protocolize as much as possible what we do on every single one of, them, of our patients. Any other questions you guys have? Jen, would you like to add on something else? Oh, I think I think that covers what um, I can share with you guys. Like I said, I'm sure some of it's like outdated with how quickly um, new evidence is coming out, but I hope that was helpful at least to give a basis for what we're doing and where it comes from. Good, so thank you very much, everybody. I really appreciate your participation here. This is our first virtual seminar. We um, are hoping to keep doing this every Friday. You will receive the uh, invitation every week and as well as the program. We're gonna try to do two presentations uh, per Friday, starting at 12 and goes all the way to 2 p.m. Um, um, so if you have any suggestion, please let us know, send me an email or send me or, or the chiefs or, or Dr. Teran, Dr. Teran right now is in, is in service. So, uh, but if there's any issue, please let us know or, or something that you want to share in general. We really appreciate that. Um, uh, one more thing, if, you, if I can ask um, the fellows to stay online uh, and everybody else can sign out, I guess, I just want to have some some chat with you guys. So, um, Jen, you can actually mute your mute your phone. Okay. Well. So, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, allow all of you. To talk, if, if if you want to, you know how how you see your, um, you can actually raise your hand. I don't know if you have that on your, on your.